Hello and welcome to the Bookkeeper 247 podcast where we explore the intersection of faith, culture through the lens of Christian hip hop. I'm your host, Daryl Kemp, and today we have with us Christian rapper, Prophet Josiah, who is the OG of OGs in Christian hip hop. <laughs> and I'm sure this interview will be enlightening and impactful to all of us listening. What's popping? Prophet Joe Stein, welcome to the show. What's poppin', man? I'm cool, and I'm I'm uh, really happy to be here, man. This is nice. I yes, like that. Sir. Yes, the sir. OG of OGs. I don't know about that, but <laughs> <laughs> but I've definitely got the old part. I'm old. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So we love to start the show off with an icebreaker, man. Okay. So who is Prophet Josiah? So uh, Prophet Josiah. I mean, the most simplest way to say it is I'm a man that's seeking God, period. Amen. First and foremost, I mean, that's really above everything. I'm an imperfect man that's trying to get right with God every single day. So that's who I am. Amen. And where are you from, Prophet Josiah? I'm originally from upstate New York, Rochester, New York, and uh, I, um, I currently live in Nashville, Tennessee. Yes, sir. What with the the from the east to the south? How did that transition? Well, the east, cold, snow. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? South, warm, nice, no snow. It's no brainer, man. I don't like being cold. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you share with us in the family, man, a little bit about your upbringing and how that inspired you? In music? Yeah, so um, I came up, I think I started listening to hip hop probably in ooh, late 80s. I was born in 77, so I think my mm -hmm. first song that I actually like remember memorizing was probably, uh, it was either Kumo D, Big Daddy Kane, or um, what's that dude's name? We're like, All the Way to Heaven. Seven heaven all the way oh, to heaven. Oh, oh. Uh, Dougie Fresh, Dougie Fresh. That's who it was. Dougie, Dougie Fresh. Fresh. That's him. That's him. That's right. Dougie Fresh. Yes, so, sir. So, so uh, I started there, and then you know what I'm saying. Uh, my family was really big into going to church. My mom especially. So we went to three services every Sunday when I was a little kid. Mm. I, I never understood why we was in church all day like that, but you know what I'm saying. That's what she <laughs> wanted to do. And then, so it was kind of like a, a known thing, like, yo, we are Christians and we're not doing things that God is not happy with. So when I started making music, it just was kind of like a default thing. Well, I guess I'm gonna be doing Christian rap then because my mom ain't trying to hear no other kind of music. <laughs> so that's yeah, how I got started. Oh man, that's a blessing. We kind of from the same area too, or from the 70 era. So tell me, man, I, I don't want the folks to see it, but I know your mama got a picture of the hard white shoes somewhere. You doing the Easter yep. speech in church or something? <laughs> yes, yeah. Yo, I definitely got the baby picture with the hard white shoes for sure. Absolutely. And yo, my mom is really big on pictures. So she probably has like pictures of me from me being a baby and maybe three or four or five or six, seven times a year. I mean, you could probably see my whole life in pictures. You know what I'm saying? When I go to her house, mm -hmm. she got pictures of everybody in the family on the wall, and you can see basically our whole life. This is when he was a baby. This is when he was a baby <laughs> and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So what, What? okay, so you, you, you said uh, mainstream hip hop was out from the beginning in your household. What made you pursue the career in rap music? When when did you say, look, I'm going to take this serious and, and start rapping? So, um, okay, well, let, well, let me, let me uh, back up a little bit. So, uh, my dad, mm -hmm. now, now, first of all, my mom and my dad got divorced, okay? So, okay. so whenever I went to my dad's house, my dad was a Christian too. My dad mm -hmm. played all types of Christian music, from jazz mm -hmm. to hip hop to, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. every kind of Christian music. So he would always mm -hmm. have these Christian rap tapes he would play in the car. And at the time, mm -hmm. 
I'm listening to all the secular hip hop that's available to me. You know what I'm saying? This is the golden era of hip hop. So he's playing these these people in the car, and I'm just like, yo, these dudes is not really good, man. I mean, the production's mm. not good, lyricists was not mm. good. I mean, not to me. So I, I, have, mm. I have to preface this. This is my own personal opinion. I know a mm. lot of people came out, they was doing their thing. It's 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 not a diss to anybody that was out at the time. It's just mm-hmm. that in comparison, when you got Big Daddy Kane, Nas, the Roots, KRS One, mm-hmm. all these people, mm-hmm. the Christian rappers were not on the same lyrical musical level that they was on. Mm-hmm. And so when he mm-hmm. plays people in the car, I just used to tell him like, man, you say I don't even rap, and I can rap better than these people. Mm-hmm. And he was like, well, prove it. You know, saying essentially, and I was like, okay, mm-hmm. wa- watch. You know, what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. So you know, what I'm saying went to the store. You know what I mean, bought a radio, bought a little Radio Shack microphone, started recording. Mm-hmm. And me and my brother made, uh, uh, I mean, like we made an album of like other people's beats and us rapping over them. And he played mm. it and he was just super open off the tape. He was like, oh man, y'all sound really good. You said, y'all sound great. So then what he would do is every time we went to church, he would call people to the truck and be like, yo, listen to this. These my sons, these my sons. And people would be like, you know, that sound pretty good, you know? Yeah. And so, you know what I'm saying? And like me and my brother are kind of looking at him like, stop doing this. Like this, we didn't want other people to hear it. Like we kind of made this for you. And you kind of like embarrassing us a little bit now. <laughs> like we not rappers. I just wanted to show you that we better than the people who's playing in the car. But because that happened so much where people kept saying that we sounded good, we started thinking, well, maybe this is something we should actually do. So then we started going to studios, started recording, jumping into talent shows. And then, so that's kind of how it got started. I guess I started taking it serious when I was around like 16. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. How did, how did, how did the dynamic, cause I'm from my parents divorced too. Mm-hmm. How did that dynamic uh, play a part in, in, in your life uh, of the divorce of your parents? Were there any struggles there? Is there any advice you can, Give the listener if this is going on in their household. Um, how did it play out? I mean, it's like they got divorced, but they were still friends. So there mm. wasn't really a, there wasn't really like a whole lot of animosity. It just was like, well, he's gonna live with me, and then you're gonna pick him up every week, and then, and then I think at some point it kind of switched. So like. So I lived with my mom first. Then around the age of 12, my mom kind of came to my dad and was like, he's starting to get to be the age where he's going to be talking to girls and doing this and that. I think he should move in with you so you can teach him more like man stuff and he can see you like every day. So then I moved in with my dad around 12. And then around like 16 or 17, I wasn't really feeling the living situation at my dad's house. But I just called my mom. I was like, yo. I'm not, I'm not really feeling this. I prayed about it. I thought about it. I think I want to move out. And she was mm-hmm. like, well, I'll come get you right now. <laughs> I was just like, mm-hmm. uh, okay, <laughs> you don't have to get me right now. But I'm just saying at the time, um, I was at home by myself and my dad was, was, was like out with the family going bowling or something like that. And so mm-hmm. my mom showed up, came in the house, helped me pack up all my stuff. And then we just basically rolled out. I mean, you know I'm saying like, I left, I left a letter like on the table. I said, hey, my mom came and got me. I'm not really feeling this situation. And you know what I'm saying? So that's where I'm at. And so I guess I guess there was a little animosity about that because he was kind of like, why did you just come here when I wasn't here or whatever? But I was mm-hmm. 17. And I think at the time, I think they ended up going to court. Oh, yeah, they did. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> okay, here's an interesting story. Okay, so we go to okay. court. My mom is on one side, my dad's on the other side. I'm sitting with my mom and the judge is kind of like, okay, so what are we here for? And my dad was, you know what I'm saying? My dad was explaining, well, you know, he was living with me and she just came and got him. And, you know, I mean, they didn't tell me what's going on, this and that. And then, you know, she explained her side and they, you know what I'm saying? They was kind of going back and forth. And the judge just was like, well, you know, like forget what y'all talking about. What do you want to do? You know what I mean? Like kind of just pointed at me. It was and I, then you said I was like, well, I want to live with my mom, and he's like, well, you say he just kind of talked to both of them like he's seventeen, and mm-hmm. you know I'm saying like in one more year he could do whatever he want to do anyway. So I'm so we just gonna go with whatever he want to do. If he want to live mm-hmm. with his mom, then that's where he's gonna be at. 
I mean, he's not 10 or 9 or, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? He's almost grown. So, um, as far as advice to other people, um, I don't really know. You know what I'm saying? Except for, you know, just just always trust God. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Like, ever since Amen. I've been around between 13 and 14, I really started believing God was real for myself. So, mm. during this whole process, I'm praying I'm talking to God. I'm trying to figure out, okay, I don't really like living with my dad. Should I move? I was praying about it. And then he just, you know what I'm saying, he kind of gave me a piece about moving with my mom. And so, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying, that's how it went. But I think that's the best advice, really, is just seek God. You know what I'm saying, just, just, just like everybody, the parents, the kids, just mm-hmm. seek God about that whole situation because it's really difficult. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's dope, too. I, I got a saying that. When the adults act stupid, the children pay for it, right? Yep. But what I like about your story is how your parents worked it out. I think that's dope uh, to be able to, uh, you know, talk and and your dad being, uh, uh, I mean, your mom being loving enough to know that, hey, my son about to get into girls and this and that. I think you need to go around your dad more. So that's a trust. And, and exactly what you said about trusting God and, and praying is definitely for the adults and the children. That's dope, man. That's a dope perspective. And I appreciate you sharing that. I appreciate so, you asking. I've never had that question before, ever. That's dope. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So now let, let's jump a, jump ahead a little bit. Um, how do you balance your roles as a rapper, an entrepreneur, and a family man? Yeah, so the balance is really just priority. Um, I don't know that mm-hmm. I have a balance, like I'm doing this the same amount of time as this, but it's just like, mm-hmm. what are my priorities? You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. right now, um, you know what I'm saying? My number one priority is really just make sure that I'm doing what God wants me to do. So mm-hmm. I'm a husband, I'm a father, my family is extremely important to me. So right after my relationship with God, I got to make sure everybody's good. And then once everybody's mm-hmm. good, then I have the grace to kind of do whatever I want after that. So I spend time with my wife. I spend time with my kids. I make sure they're good. And then I kind of dip away and turn the music on. <laughs> and, um, you know, like right now, my job is really flexible. So I have a really blessing of a job. Like I could do a lot of stuff for myself at work. Cause I don't, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to say it, but my job gives me like a lot of flexibility. So I could do all my duties at work and still have time left over to do personal stuff. And as long as I get mm-hmm. my main stuff done, I'm supposed to get done at work. They don't really care what else I do. So I just use a lot of time at work to get done what I need to get done. And so by the time I get home, I got time to spend time with family because I don't really have the, okay, I spent all day at work. Now I got to work on my business. And then I got a little bit of time for my family. It's like, well, well, at, at work, I got a lot of stuff done for my business and for mm-hmm. my music and my marketing and all that stuff. Now I could just chill. Amen. And speaking of music, marketing and everything mm-hmm. uh, above, Tell us about how was it like being in the group Profits? Profits, man. That was a group of me and my brother. Uh, that's that's the, um, I mean, Profits is really special to me, man. Like, that's how we started. You know what I'm saying? We started rapping in uh, 1993. This is in the attic of my grandmother's house. Like, that's where we got the radio I was telling you about. And, uh, and uh, that's where we was really, like, beginning. It was like, okay, so we're going to buy these tapes. Because back then... You know what I'm saying you could go to the store buy singles and they had instrumentals on them. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And like sometimes they would have extra instrumentals that was on there too. You know what I'm saying? Like a special mm. remix instrumental or whatever. And so mm. you know at the time we started writing our own songs and we would like hold the mic a certain kind of way so that the volume would be just right. And we would do ad libs by recording it one time and then taking that dub and recording it onto another tape. We said with our vocals already on it, but this time doing fake echoes like yo, 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 yo. <laughs> you know, and yeah, 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 yeah. And so, uh, you know what I'm saying? We created our own um our own songs, and then mm-hmm. from there, 
when we went back home, not because my grandmother lived in another state. Now, I mean, she lived in Pennsylvania. And so, okay. you know, like we would go there for the summers. And when we came back home to Rochester, we would jump on all the talent shows. And I remember the first talent show we did, we were like really scared because we had never really rapped in front of other people like that. And mm-hmm. so, but it came out to be so good, man. And you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. To see the crowd, you know, just really, you know, saying resonate with what you're saying and what you're doing. It's like, oh, y'all like this? Okay. So <laughs> now there's not really a reason to be nervous. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes, we can just do what we do. Yes, sir. Man, I missed that. We had a spot here called Music and More, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, I guess everything that faded was screaming. But just going in through there, flipping through the albums. Yeah. Uh, even when they got the CDs and tapes and, and you had to really find, uh, you know, uh, sometimes, which is a big part of music now, we're going to get into this later. Sometimes it wasn't even about the artist that got my attention. It was the cover art. Yeah. I'm like, whoa, this dope right here. Let me let me check this out. And, and man, I just, I'm reminiscing, but I miss them days of, of the record stores because everything's screaming now. So, yeah, so you know, yeah. yeah. But you know so, what was dope about the record store too? You know what I'm saying? Not to cut mm-hmm. you off, but, but you know what I'm saying? But oh, we would nah, go yeah. in the record store, we see all the mm-hmm. tapes, and mm-hmm. we would always be like, when we get famous, our tapes mm. will be right here. Because it used to be like an alphabetical mm. order. So we'd be like, mm-hmm. yo, P, Prophet's going to be <laughs> right here in this spot. And we would, mm. you know what I'm saying? We was just envisioning it like, yo, this is where we going to be at. You know what I'm saying? And I remember mm-hmm. we used to walk through the mall and have our um, our tapes, you know what I mean, like in a Walkman. And we would just walk up to people and be like, yo, these, these cats out of Buffalo, Yo, they super fire. We part of their marketing team. You know what I'm saying? Why don't you mm-hmm. listen to this? You know what I'm saying? If you like it, you know what I mean? We got the tapes you can buy them from us. And so the people will listen mm-hmm. like, oh, man, this is good. Like, yo, these dudes is hot. Like, cool. Tape is $5. You know what I mean? They would give us the $5. We'd be like, yo, that's not dudes out of Buffalo. That's us. You know what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. we knew if we walked up to people and said, this is us, people wouldn't give mm-hmm. you the same kind of love because you're standing right in front of them. So they would be kind of like, oh, let me say, I'm not, I'm not really mm-hmm. rocking with you. Mm-hmm. But if you say you from somewhere else and you represent other people, people would say mm-hmm. what they really felt about the music. And then after they said what they felt and they gave us the five dollars, now it's too late. You know what I'm saying? You already said you mm-hmm. liked it. So, you know what I'm saying? That's mm-hmm. us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, that's dope, man. Any reunion plans for profits? Um, I don't think so. I am thinking about working on um, working on a documentary. I mean, just for myself, I feel like we was around at the very beginning of Christian rap. I mean, not the super very beginning, but like right after the beginning, we was right there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That's and, right. Um, I feel like people don't really know that much about me. So when I make music now. I get looked at like I'm a brand new artist. And so it's like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, you just came out in 2016. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I've been out since 1993. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yes, and I remember mm-hmm. I was in a Facebook group one time and I was talking to somebody and dude was saying that, you know what I'm saying? He had, he had been in the game for so long and it's this and that and he knew everybody. And, and he was like, yeah, cause I've been in the game for 10 years. And I was just like 10 years. I think it was like 2017 or 18 at the time. And I'm thinking like, I've been around since 93. And you're bragging about being around for 10 years. Like, that's not even a long time to me. (laughs) And he was like, oh, okay. Well, I never heard of you. I'm like, okay, well, you never heard of me. But that don't mean I wasn't here. (laughs) Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Man, I'm, I'm trying to do the math. So 30 years out here, right? Uh, yeah, 30 years what this you're year. Doing, man. Yes, sir. That's why I said the OG are OGs, right? In the in the beginning, right? Yeah. So what's what do you see the bigger difference between Christian hip hop then and now? I think I think the biggest difference now is that you're saying Christian hip hop actually exists now. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, there's a whole industry that you could go mm-hmm. online, you could submit music to places. You can mm-hmm. go rapping pretty much anywhere and they accept the fact that you do Christian rap. Mm-hmm. Back then, none of that existed. Like mm-hmm. there was, there was mm-hmm. no outlet for you to mm-hmm. do Christian rap 
other than your yeah. church if your church accepted the fact that you mm. Christian rap because yeah, right. you know what I'm saying at that time there was a whole lot of rap is the devil <laughs> you know what I'm saying like you can't come in here doing that hippity hoppity stuff and I remember <laughs> one time now I mean like when we first started we didn't have our own drum machines and stuff like that so we used beats mm. that we got out of the stores mm. and so um we was rapping at our church and Biggie had a um I forgot the name of the song, but the original song that he sampled was Between the Sheets by um Brothers. Isley Brothers. Brothers. Mm -hmm. So, but we didn't know about the Ozzy Brothers. All we knew was Biggie. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. and our church had a lot of older people in it. So mm. we get on the stage, we're doing our song, you know what I'm saying? Jesus is whatever, whoop de wop. <laughs> and all the older people are like, they really playing between the sheets up in here. <laughs> and so after we got done, a lot of the a lot of the older people in the church came to my mom and was like, you know, they was rapping over between the sheets. <laughs> and that's when they kind of told my mom, it's like, you really need to get your sons in a music studio where they can create their own music because they can't come in here <laughs> wrapping over between the sheets. <laughs> and so that's when um, my mom uh, really, um, you know, kind of made the first investment into us going to a music studio and like getting like our own music and recording our own music and stuff like that. Yeah, that's crazy because I'm thinking of 93, like now you got the Reach Records, yeah. you got, uh, man, you got, uh, man, Derek Minor and them camps, you Derek got, Minor, uh, you know what I'm saying, you got Bizzle Joint, Bizzle, I mean, it's yeah, labels yeah, now. And then you got money. a bunch of labels that people don't even know. That's I mean, right. back that's then, right. the only labels were like the gospel group Christian labels. So we were sending out we were sending out demo tapes everywhere. And I remember mm -hmm. a lot of people sent the demos back. Now, I mean, like, they didn't even open them. They just was like, mm. you know I'm saying, we don't accept unsolicited demos. And then a couple mm -hmm. people, they opened it. They said they liked it, but they wanted us to make some more songs and send it back. And I remember feeling like, if you like it, why don't you pay for us? to go back and make more music it don't make sense for us to keep sending you demos like i, I, just, I just i just thought that was stupid at the time and so um i remember commission came to our church one time they was doing a concert and because we knew the people at the church they let us kind of go backstage and mingle with the famous people and stuff like that so we was trying to talk to them about getting a record deal and giving them our demo and stuff like that and um i remember they was looking at us and they was like, you know, well, what's your image? And we was like, our image? Like, what do you mean? And they were like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what's your your image? Like, what's your brand? And we was just kind of like, you looking at it. You know what I'm saying? This is what we look like. You know what I'm saying? This is our brand. You know what I'm saying? Listen to the music. And we don't. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and they was kind of like, well, you know, y'all got to like get you an image together and you got to do this and that. And at the time... We just kind of felt like, you know what? We just gonna have to do this by ourselves. You know what I'm saying? Nobody's gonna put us on. We gotta put ourselves on. <laughs> and that's when we started jumping in a bunch of talent shows, making our own tapes, making our own music. And I remember at the time we started, um, uh, we started becoming popular like in our own city. And um, <laughs> somebody started a rumor that we got a record deal. It was, it was it was like really weird. Like oh, wow. everywhere we went, people was like, "Oh yes, yeah, so I heard y'all got that record deal." And we like, don't have a record deal. Don't know where you heard that from. Cause we would be on, you know what I'm saying? Like different radio stations doing interviews, freestyling and stuff like that. And I remember um, our manager at the time, he was, he was going to different churches and preaching. And so every church he went to, he would tell them about us. And um, he would tell the youth group to call the radio station and ask them to play our music. And so I guess one day, like a bunch of people called and the uh, DJ came over the air and was like, yo, I keep hearing about this group called Prophets. Everybody wanting to play their music. I don't know who they are. If you out there listening, call in. Well, you know what I'm saying? We wasn't listening to the radio at the time. Somebody told us mm -hmm. about it like a week later. They was like, yo, they was asking for you on the radio last week. And I was like, mm -hmm. we didn't know about it. So we never got a chance to connect with them. 
Mm. Yeah, that's dope, man. I'm also thinking this too, because I asked everybody this. Uh, from 93 to 2023, Birmingham, Alabama, that's all I'm going to speak about. I don't see the difference between the church then and the church now about <laughs> Christian hip hop, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm talking about for real. You know, yeah. I I was part of a church that that older saints and and I'm just gonna keep it real, older black saints, right? And the music was still demonized and this and that. But eventually, they started asking me to kind of put something together for the kids, right? You know, of course, it's always for so, the kids. <laughs> that's right. It's all, always only for kids, the kids listen to hip hop, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So, how do you think that we can present ourselves? And and what's sad is, and I'm blunt, kind of, mm-hmm. but reserved on this show, so I'm gonna say it. What's sad is, is that the black churches, a lot of them with limited resources, don't adapt to Christian hip hop, right? To me, from my experience, and then the white churches, especially the mega white churches, mm-hmm. they're already on the Lecrae's, the Bizzles, the Trip Lees, the, you know, whoever else, uh, you know, out there. They're already on there in these youth groups and stuff. So how can we present this uh, Christian hip hop to to the minority people? As far as the church is concerned, I don't really know. Um, I'm mm-hmm. not really, I mean, to be, you know what I'm saying, just as blunt as you are, I don't I don't really care whether the church accepts it or not. You know what I'm saying? Like, Amen. You know, I came mm-hmm. up in a time where none of the churches accepted it. So mm-hmm. we just decided we just was going to rap in non-church situations. So you know I'm saying we was in secular talent shows. We was in secular venues and the places that did accept us, you know what I mean? And we wrapped at their churches. And um, and kind of like the older I got, the less I liked rapping at church because, like I said, they they put you in, in front of a bunch of kids. And so I remember I was maybe 19, 20, 22, and we got booked to rap at this church. And it was like literally four and five-year-olds in the front. <clears throat> And then mm. it got older as you went back. I think the oldest person might have been a teenager. And I remember thinking, mm. like, I'm not doing this anymore. Like, this five-year-old doesn't know what I'm talking about. Because I'm not talking about little kid stuff. I'm talking about grown man stuff. I'm talking about being a 20-year-old mm. and getting with chicks and not getting with chicks. And you know saying how God is dealing with me and different things like that. And you got a five-year-old that just wants to jump around because of the beat. And I'm just like... Mm. My music doesn't talk to five-year-olds. And Mm -hmm. I noticed that has never really left. Like, I see videos Mm -hmm. online right now of people rapping in churches, Mm -hmm. and I see five and six and seven-year-olds in the front. I'm just like, this Mm doesn't make sense. Like, like hip-hop is listened to by everybody. Young kids, Mm middle-aged, adults, people Mm -hmm. that's over 50 is listening to Mm -hmm. hip-hop because they grew up with it. But the mm-hmm. church is like, oh, this is for kids. But it's only for kids in church. It's not for kids anywhere else. Mm-hmm. So I mm-hmm. don't, I don't, I don't really know how you could present it to the church. But I think just in general, just go where God tells you to go. You know what I'm saying? Like you know what I'm saying, like I feel mm-hmm. like reach the people that God has called you to reach, whatever age group that is. If they happen to be available in church, then boom. If they don't, then get out of the church, go stand on the corner, grab you a microphone, and go rap. Like, yo, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, mm-hmm. you know, back in the day, we used to we used to be around Mike Peace. Mike Peace is one of the early Christian rap heads, you know what I'm saying? And he was kind of like a mentor to us. And he would mm-hmm. just he would just pull up on the block, set up speakers, set up some microphones in the middle of the hood, turn the beat on, and just be like, yo, just start rapping. People are gonna come over here. And that's what we would do. Mm-hmm. And you know what I'm saying? And then when they came over there, he would give the gospel. I'm saying sometimes people got saved, sometimes they didn't. But the point is, we was out there where the regular people was at. You know what I'm saying? You know, and, and, you know, sometimes we was at church, sometimes we wasn't. But it wasn't relegated to church. It just was like, we need to be wherever people who like this music are. Mm. Yeah, that's dope. That's a dope perspective, man. One time before we move on, I was talking to 
a guy at my old church about Christian hip hop. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, it's dope. But what I don't like about it, if I want to be convicted by, by music, is why I don't listen to it, right? You know, he'd rather <laughs> listen to the regular rap music, right? Because I guess he just want to vibe with it, right? Right. That that kind of blew my mind, Prophet. I was like, okay, that's the point, though, <laughs> to yeah. be convicted, you know. So, but yeah, man. So he said he didn't want to uh, be convicted. That's why he didn't want to listen to it. Yeah, that's why he didn't want to listen to it because I think like my playlist. You know, back then I have like the thizzle on and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bizzle, more street orientated, yep. you know, things mm -hmm. like that, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it would blow people's mind like that's Christian rap. Right. You know, so, you know, but they a hey, that was his answer. Right. So I just I was like, OK, cool. At least he was upfront and honest, mm -hmm. you know, and that and means see, that's what they're supposed to do. He that's was, right. He's so convicted. He don't even. He running from it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And I'll say this too, because I like your answer about you know whether church let me in or not. Cool. You know mm -hmm. because technically we are the church, and I think that's what the problem is. What are we as parents listening to and bringing in front of our children when we not in service? Right. And that's what I think the problem is, and that's one of. The many problems I think why this why it hasn't grown to where I think it should be me personally because I'm a fan of it right? right because of the uh and then when we just break off from the church and talk about minority households uh, we know what type of music that they're playing in front of their children mm -hmm. you know so but I never really thought of the aspect of what what is the church parent playing in front of their children, you know, because right. they're going to listen to rap. I think this is the 50-year reunion this year exactly. of rap music. They mm -hmm. said it was going to die years ago, and now it you know, it's not it's dying. Over the it's, world, man. Hip-hop is all exactly, over. Exactly, in hip-hop. So the children going black, white, yellow, green. The children going to listen to rap music. I ain't never seen a green kid, but okay. <laughs> 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 yes, sir. So, so from profits, the group to putting the music down for a minute, right? Yeah. Can you tell us the story and share with the family what made you pick the mic back up? Yeah. So, um, well, first let me back up a little bit. So, the reason it was put down was just because of life. You know, what I'm saying I got married. Amen. Um, my brother and I wasn't really a group anymore, and so. <clears throat> It just, I mean, my music started getting more and more spaced out because I had other stuff to do. I had to go to work. I was really active at my church, so I was doing the sound at the church. So I had to be there for rehearsal, for choir, for you know, all types of stuff. And I just got like mm -hmm. super busy, and then I just didn't have time for music. And so, and I started focusing on my businesses. You know, what I'm saying as as, mm -hmm. as I get to be in, into my thirties, I'm more interested in making money. So me and my wife mm -hmm. can buy a house. Or, we could have things mm -hmm. and you know saying whatever. And um I remember going on Facebook one day and my cousin was on there and she said, Oh, oh my god, my cousin, um, uh, no, um, my brother, my brother just just got shot and he's dead. Mm -hmm. And I'm and I'm watching the thing, I'm watching the video, like one, mm -hmm. nobody's called me and told me this. I'm seeing it like on Facebook. So I'm just like, yo. Mm -hmm. So then I started making phone calls and I find out, um, you know, he was murdered really without an explanation. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if it was like a mistaken identity or somebody thought he was somebody else or they thought he had something to do with something. You know what I'm saying? He was he was actually at a talent show, you know what I'm saying? Performing his music. Um, now, I mean, he wasn't doing Christian music, but he was at a talent show just performing his music, came out. And uh, somebody happened to be watching him the whole time, and he basically kind of got executed, like, outside of the place. And um, that just really kind of messed me up a little bit. But right after that, I started getting this feeling like, you're supposed to be making music and you're not doing it. And that probably could have prevented something like this. And I was just thinking, like, I must be bugging because people die every day. My music is not preventing people from getting murdered. So I don't know what you talking about. This was, I, mean, I wasn't sure if it was God talking to me or if it was just me just being upset. And um, 
But that feeling kept coming back to me. Like, I think you're supposed to be making music. And it, it came back so strong. I just was like, okay, okay, I'm going to make a song. And then that feeling will go away. And then at the time, too, I'm watching a lot of our old videos and stuff that we used to perform at. You know what I'm saying? And I'm thinking like, you know what? Maybe I'm just feeling nostalgic around the same time that he got murdered. And so I'm feeling like maybe I'm supposed to be doing this. And so I said, well, I'm going to make one song. So I made a song in 2016. I put it out. I actually talk about what happened in my life at the time. And... Um, <laughs> I just was waiting to see if that feeling would go away. And I kind of presented it to God too. Like, look, I made a song. If that was you, I made a song. There it is. I'm ready to get back to my business now so I could do some music. No, no, I mean, I mean not do some music, but so I can make some money. And um, the feeling just never less. Like, nah, I think you need to make some more music. So then I made a new song. And it's like, every time I made a new song, I would feel more like I'm supposed to be doing more. Like, oh, that's not enough. You need to make another one. You need to do another one. You need to do another one. And it just became so like, uh, I guess it was like annoying to me. Like, yo, you need to make more music. And I'm like, I don't want to make music. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in my 40s. I'm in my late 30s. Like, I don't really want to make music now. You know what I'm saying? When I first started making music, the origin of me starting to make music was because my dad played music for me in Christian rap that I didn't think was good. So I felt like we were needed. So I was like, you know, I need to make music because I don't like the way these people are representing Christians as far as rapping is concerned. And I feel like we could do it better. So we're going to do it better. So in 2016, I'm listening to current Christian rap. All right, these dudes is fire. Like, I don't have that feeling of, I need to be here. Like you got a lot of people out here making music and they're doing it very well. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, I don't understand what you need me for. You got Ishan, you got Bizzle, you got, it was a lot of people I was listening to. And I was like, these dudes are way better than me. So I don't know what you want me out here for. And um, it, it, it just kept getting stronger. And I just kind of caved in. I said, okay, this is what God wants me to do. I'm going to do it. And so um, I put out an album called God Made Me Do It. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because that's what I felt like, is that God is making me do this. Uh, I don't feel like he's really making me do it now because I want to do it. But it's more so of I'm not doing this because I just I just want to be famous or, you know what I'm saying, because I feel like I'm just the dopest MC. I, I just feel like there's a group of people that like what I do. And I don't see anybody else doing what I do. You know what I'm saying? I rap from a from a golden era kind of kind of vibe, and there's not a lot of people doing that. So that's my lane. And when I see the comments I get, and when I get the feedback, and when I get messages in my DMs and stuff of, of people telling me, man, this music really blessed me, man. Thank you for, you know what I'm saying, for this song. It made me cry and all these different things. I'm like, oh, wow. So I am needed. And I thought I wasn't. Mm. Man, that's dope. That's a dope perspective. I hate that your cousin had to pass away like that in a tragic event like that. Yeah. But just hearing your story, it made me think of how your calling and obedience will out trump talent. Absolutely. Just do it. You know, just do it. God called you to do it do it so I, of course i love the title of the album and we'll get into the deluxe later in the show but just do it man so right now family stay locked in to the bookkeeper 247 as we sitting here kicking it with prophet josiah we'll be back after these messages after all right these messages will be right <laughs> back Welcome back to the Bookkeeper 247 Podcast, where we are sitting down and kicking it with Prophet Josiah. This is the part that we love the most, the testimony story. Talk to us about the transition of unsaved Prophet Josiah to accepting Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. No doubt. So uh, this, this, is, this is an interesting story, too. Uh, I don't have the... I don't have the horror story. I was in the world doing all the wild, nasty things, and then God. Like, <laughs> that, that's, that, that's not my story. But but I tell you what it is, though. Um, 
I mean, like I told you earlier, I grew up in church. And so I remember around, um, I'll say around, around 17, 18, I decided, I said, I need to know if God is actually real. Because if he's not, it's a lot of stuff I could be getting into. You know what I'm saying? When you 18 to 25, you feel like, yo, I could do whatever I want. I got a car, I got a job. It's chicks feeling me. I, like I need to know if God's real or not. I can't go off of what my mom said, what my dad said, what grandma said. And I remember um, kind of posing questions to God like, well, if you're really real, I'm gonna need you to do X, Y, and Z. And I remember saying that and then nothing happened. And then I started to feel like, wow, I guess he's not real. I told him to do something. He didn't do it. <laughs> and then and then something kind of hit me like, like you, you are, you are not really approaching this the right way. And I was thinking like, I don't, I don't know how I asked him to do the thing. He didn't do the thing. So he must not be real. And then I started thinking like, so if you were God and some peon of an ant person thing, tells you to do something, that's what you're going to do? And I was like, okay, you're right about that. If the ant is on the ground telling me I better do something or I'm not real, I don't really care what this ant think. I'm, I'm just going to go about my business. And so I said, okay, maybe I need to approach this differently. And so I said, well, okay, um, I'm going to act as if you are real. And so therefore I'll have expectations of you. And then... I'm going to start reading the scripture and I'm going to start applying it to my life. And after I read mm -hmm. and pray and study the scripture, start applying it to my life. If these things don't pan out like they panned out in scripture, if you don't show up, then I know you're not real because I did everything that you told me to do. And I'm actually doing it with an open heart. You know what I'm saying? I actually came to him like, yo, I'm going to open up and I'm going to assume you're real. So if you are real, then what does it say I'm supposed to do? Okay, Paul said whatever. Okay, so I need to do that. So I just started doing what the scripture actually says. And mm -hmm. <laughs> it was funny to me, like God starts showing up, like, oh snap. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? From like, from like praying for stuff to um just seeing God move in my life, seeing like circumstances just kind of rearrange themselves right after I mm -hmm. asked God to do something. And um, I mean, like one of those times was, I mean, I told you about my parents being divorced and how my mom came mm -hmm. and got me. Well, one of those situations was I was praying about it before she came and got me. And I was asking God, should I move or should I not move? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, um, you know, <laughs> this is something I wouldn't suggest people do. But this is what I did at the time. I had a deck of cards. You know what I mean? Because I used to like playing cards. And so I'm mixing up the cards. I'm shuffling the cards. I'm shuffling the cards. I said, um, I'm going to flip these cards over. And if the cards come out in order, then I know you want me to leave. So I started flipping the cards over. And it was seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king. Oh, snap. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's probably just coincidence. Let me, I ain't shuffle them good enough. So, <laughs> so I shuffle the cards <laughs> up again. I shuffle them up again. Mm -hmm. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, this time I want the cards to go. If the cards go lower, that means you want me to leave. King, queen, mm -hmm. jack, ten, nine, eight. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yo. I, so I went through this thing like five or six times. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I keep reshuffling them. Uh, I'm just, I'm just like, man, this can't be real. Like this, this doesn't happen. And so, um, and, uh, I said, I'm gonna do it one more time. And I think on the seventh or eighth time it didn't work. And it was almost like, how many times do you have to do it? You did it five or six times and it came up exactly to what you said. You said you wanted the numbers to go up. You said you wanted to go down. You said you wanted to go black, red, black, red. Like, like everything you said, I made that happen. And now on the eighth time, it doesn't work. Well, I wonder why. Like, how many times I got to show you? And so that's an mm -hmm. example of God just showing up. And that, you understand, that type of stuff just encouraged my faith. But at the beginning, it was really just me putting God to the test and seeing if he was actually real. And once I realized he was real, it just, it just kind of changed my life. I just was like, 
I can't believe people are not on this. Like, you pray and God actually shows up. You read, mm. you do what the scripture says, and then he does what it does. I just was like, yo. And I would be telling people, my friends and stuff like that, I'm like, yo, God is real, yo. And they used to be like, what happened to you? Like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, yo. I, and I started telling them the stuff I was doing, and they're like, I feel what you're saying, but like, I'm on something else. And I'm like, yo, I don't think you get what I'm saying. Like, this is actually real. Like, you pray, you ask God for the thing, you do what the scripture says, and it actually, he does it. And I, this was amazing to me because my mom and my grandma and my dad didn't tell me stuff like that. It just was like, yo, you need to get saved so you don't go to hell type. And, but this was like, I was actually witnessing God do real stuff in my life. And, mm-hmm. and you know, I was coming at it from a very logical standpoint. I'm like, if God is real, in the scripture, he said he's not a he's not a respecter of persons. So that means I don't have to be a pastor for God to talk to me. And I remember mm-hmm. being in church on a Sunday and they used to have like a testimony service and people would get up and they would be like, oh, God, bless me with this. God did that. God did this. And I remember sitting there like, you said you're not a respecter of persons. Ain't none of this stuff ever happened to me. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I'm asking you for a job. I'm asking you for money. I'm asking you for this. I'm asking you for that. And I don't never see none of this. And I just thought this was whack. I was like, yo, like, how is it everybody got a story except for me? And it was like, <laughs> right after that, everything started happening. And I just was like, okay, <laughs> this is, this is, this is really, really real. And then, so like, that was around the time I was 18. And then around 21, this is what I like to say is where like I got set on fire. It was like I was saved, but I was still kind of doing other things I probably shouldn't do because I knew there was grace and all this different stuff. But when I turned 21, it was like something was burning on the inside of me. Like you need to tell other people about me and reveal me to other people so they could get to know me like you know me. So that's what started happening. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I had this thing I made up in my mind well, I was like, if I'm around anybody for more than two or three minutes, I'm going to start talking about God. Mm. And I would literally look at my clock. So, like, if I got in the elevator with somebody and they would get, you know what I'm saying? And let's say it got stuck or something like that. I'll be looking at my clock. It's been about two and a half minutes. It's been three minutes. I will turn to the person. And I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, do you know God or something like that. But I would create a conversation where God would be brought up. So I would be like, yo, you go to church? And they'd be like, nah, I don't go to church. Or they say, yes, I do, or whatever. And I'd be like, yeah, man, God is really real out here. And I would just let the conversation just kind of play itself out. And I would do that all the time. Because I just was like, at some point, I'm going to find out whether this person is saved or they not saved. And then based upon what they say, I'm going to craft this conversation where they need to get saved or I'm going to leave them with some type of scripture or something. And um, I haven't done that in a long time, but <laughs> but that's what it was like at first. <laughs> yes, uh, kind of listening to your testimony remind me of uh, Gideon a little bit. Uh, when you yep, were talking about the, the test. cars. Now, yeah, did the test, right? Uh, mm-hmm. One night, and I might be off one night uh, in the morning, make, make, it, make it wet, the mat wet, and the, Next, make it dry, you right. know. So that kind of remind me of when you was talking about with the card, right? But like you said, don't, don't. That's not the best advice we yeah, want you not. to do. But yeah. yeah, yeah, you know. I would never but suggest it, it, somebody do that, but but I think mm-hmm. if you come to God in an honest, like I really want to know if you are legitimately real, whatever mm-hmm. that causes you to do after you feel like that, do that. That's what that you say. I did those things I did. Um, it wasn't like a, I'm trying to prove God's not real. It was I want to see if you are legitimately real. And like I said, when I first started out, I did things and it, you know, I'm saying like it didn't work because my heart wasn't right. I was like, well, look, if you don't do this, then you ain't God. I was like, I'm not doing anything. I know who I am. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but when my heart changed, and I was like, okay. Let's start reading the scripture. Let's do all the things that the Bible says. Let's really seek after him. Let's go after him. That's when he showed up. And so Mm -hmm. that helped me to see like, okay, God doesn't really need to prove himself to anybody. 
But if you really want to get to know him, he will make himself available to you. But you got to really want him. Mm. Amen. Amen. I think you just answered this, but I always get the opportunity to talk to that one person out there that's feeling like it's impossible to win. If you could talk to that person right now that's on the fence of accepting Christ and God's will for their life, what advice would you give them? Yeah, I mean, the same thing I just said. Like, I mean, if you on the fence, really seek God because God is actually real. And um, I think I think the main thing is you have to you have to almost lay aside all your presuppositions because we all grew up a certain kind of way. We all heard a bunch of different things. And nowadays, everybody's on the Internet researching stuff. And it's just like you really just need to just go home, close the door, make sure there's no distractions and just be like, God, if you're really real. I want to see you. I want to hear you. I want to know you. But it has to be genuine. It can't be if you don't show up in five minutes, then nah. You don't get to dictate how God shows up. This is the king of the universe. He created all things. You don't get to mm -hmm. come to this person and dictate what he better do or you won't believe him. Like, who are you? <clears throat> like, you're saying you don't get to dictate that. So come to God believing that he, you know, saying that there's a possibility that he is actually real. There's an actual king of the universe that wants to get to know you. You don't dictate things to him. You come humbly like, okay, look, I don't know if you're real or not, but this is what I feel. Can you please show yourself to me? Cause I really want to know you like, come like that. Not on some, you better, if you don't do this, I'm going to do me. We'll just go do you. How about that? That's right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And you're listening to the Bookkeeper 247 podcast. And we sit down with this engaging conversation with Prophet Josiah. We'll be back after these messages. Right. All right. <laughs> That's the yes, Looney Tunes sir. joint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sir. Uh, these kids don't even know nothing about Looney Tunes no more either. Yeah, <laughs> Good man. Yes, yeah, sir. All right. <clears throat> we get to the last segue, bro. Um, <clears throat> all right. Here we go. All right. <clears throat> Welcome back to the Bookkeeper 247 podcast, where we are sitting down with Prophet Joe Sadie. Man, in this segue, we love to talk Christian hip hop. Okay. Let's go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What are some of the positives and negatives you see in Christian hip hop? Um, let's start with the positives. Um, it's super fire. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I came up where I did not think Christian hip hop was good at all. And now everybody's dope. I mean, not everybody, but it's a lot of dope people from all ranges, all styles. Um, it's people that. You know what I'm saying? Like, we got something for everybody. If you want people that really dig in the scripture and tell you about Jesus, we got that. You just got saved yesterday and you just want to hear, you know, a lovely day rap song. We got that. If you in the middle, we got that. Like, wherever part of your walk or whatever you want to listen to, we got that. You know what I'm saying? And so, I mean, Christian hip hop is just really, really dope right now. Um as far as the negatives, I think some of the negatives are, at least online anyway, people get caught up in things that just don't matter. It's just like, why are we arguing about this? Like, this doesn't even, well, this, this rapper, he believes whatever. This rapper, he believes this. And, you know, that's not really good doctrine. And that, that it's, it just doesn't matter, bro. Like, do what God told you to do. Like, unless this person is like really leading people astray with, like telling people to go serve the devil or something like that. Like, just let them do what they do. Like, just do what God told you to do. You know what I'm saying? I feel like there's too many people focused on what other people are doing. Like, just do what you call, you know what I'm saying? What God called you to do. I think another negative thing is that, um, you know, like similar to the world, it's a lot of people that sound the same. It's not a whole lot mm. of original voices, original you know, rap styles, like everybody has like, I won't say everybody, but there's a lot of people that sound similar to me where to the point where I'm getting them mixed up. I'm like, oh, that's, that's so-and-so. 
that's not so and so. That's somebody else. They just rap the same exact way, and they use the same exact inflections. Like everything is very very similar. And when I came up, you wasn't allowed to do that. If you sounded remotely close to anybody, you got called out immediately. You know what I'm saying? Like like yo, we would be outside rapping, and you know what I'm saying. And if somebody heard you. And you said a line Red Man said, or you sound, you know what I'm saying, you said something that, you know I'm saying, like, even your voice, if your voice sounded like somebody else, uh, oh, shut up, you trying to sound like so-and-so. And so, mm-hmm. it's like, you got, you got ridiculed immediately, where now, mm-hmm. everybody sounds the same, and if you say the same things and do the same things, it's almost like, yeah, that's how you're supposed to rap. Everybody does that. Well, why did you want to sound like everybody, bro? Like, or sis? Like, <laughs> Do you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's interesting because my next question uh, that I was going to ask in your promo video, right mm-hmm. for your new album, yeah. you said you like the Sade <laughs> of Christian hip hop, right? Uh-huh. Uh, but you just spitting that, you know what bothered you? Everybody sounds the same. Is that what that promo was about? About you? Um, I mean, this, you know what I'm saying? Me, me saying I'm the Sade of Christian rap was really because um, I don't hear anybody telling Sade to switch her sound up. I don't hear anybody telling Sade, you know saying, like I've heard many times, man, that's not old school. Oh, man, that, you know what I'm saying? You should use different beats or you should do this, you should do that. And I'm just like, yo, I'm not changing. Like, I'm doing what I do. This is, this is my lane. I'm in it. And there's not... In fact, I might be one of like three people in this lane and I don't even sound like them people like Mm -hmm. and I feel like when Sade comes out, everybody just loves her music. It's like she put Mm -hmm. out songs in 80s, 90s, 2000s, and you could play them all together and they don't sound different. Like they sound like that's Sade. That's her sound. And Mm -hmm. that's basically what I'm saying is that I'm the Sade of Christian rap. Like I got my own sound. This is me. It's not new. It's not old. It's me. Like I'm being who I am. Where a lot of people are switching their sounds to match whatever the current sound is. Like, well, you're saying now trap is the sound. So let's do trap. Oh, oh, you know what? Now they're doing Afro beats. Let's do Afro beats. And it's just like, I mean, if that's what you naturally do, cool. But like, it's a lot of people just hopping on whatever their current trends are instead of just being who they are. I'm just being who I am. If you like it, cool. If you don't, cool, it's not for you. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like sometimes the artist can you can lose God's voice and trying to stay relevant? Um, anytime you're trying to follow any anybody but God, you're always gonna lose something. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm you know what I'm saying. Uh, um, I think, I don't know if God cares about this or not. So it depends on what you mean by trying to stay relevant. I think it's important that you're relevant to whoever your audience is. So like, yeah. I feel like my audience is people that like boom bap hip hop. So I'm gonna do boom bap hip hop because that's what I like, and I feel like that's relevant. I feel like that is relevant to them. Um, if I start switching and I'm doing what other people are doing. I'm going to lose that audience and I'm probably going to lose whatever audience I think I'm a game because they could tell you're trying too hard to do that. Like this clearly is not you. You didn't do this before mm-hmm. and now you're trying to do this and you're not even that good at it because you're still trying to play catch up. Um, I think you can lose God's voice in that, but not necessarily mm-hmm. because God might be the one telling you to switch up. So mm-hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's dope right there. Man, you mentioned it earlier about rapping in front of the kids. But I know from listening to your music, your music is grown for grown-ups. Yes, sir. With grown-up topics. Yes, sir. You feel that's what's missing in Christian hip-hop? I don't feel it's missing. I just feel like there's not enough of it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I know... Um, what's his name? Uh Show Baraka makes really mm-hmm. good music. Um, mm-hmm. There's some other people too that I just can't think of at the moment. But mm-hmm. like, it isn't, it isn't, it isn't. Um, and I think this is just hip hop in general. It's not just Christian hip hop. I think hip hop in mm-hmm. general lacks 
a grown up perspective. Like I'm buying houses, I'm starting businesses, I'm a grown man, I'm trying to take care of my wife and my kids. It's like people will make us like one song about it or two songs mm-hmm. about it, but then they fall mm-hmm. right back into the I'm I'm making money, I'm getting chicks, and you know I'm nice. Mm-hmm. And I know this Christian mm-hmm. hip hop does it a lot too. It's like, I mean, mm-hmm. but they just do it in a different way. Instead of saying I'm getting money, I'm blessed. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I ain't got chicks, but like God is blessing me so much. I'm making all this money. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And it's, but it's still the same thing. You just Christianized mm-hmm. it. And I feel like mm-hmm. God can't be telling all these people to do all the same thing. That don't make sense to me. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, maybe he told you, 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 and you, those 10 people. But not a hundred of y'all. He didn't tell a hundred of y'all to do the same thing. What's happening is Mm -hmm. you're watching these people. They have what you want. They're successful. They are getting a lot of plays. They're getting a lot of shows. And you want that. So maybe I should do what they're doing. And it's Mm -hmm. just like, that's just dumb to me. Like, do what God told you to do. Yes, sir. And man, I'm gonna give a shout out to OB over there, Brad Silla. I was watching Critique Friday one night. And yeah, I'm praying for that, that brother mental health too, and praying that everything is going good with him. I see, I see they back at uh, Critique Friday. Yeah, but mm-hmm. I was listening to him one night talking about this exactly what we're talking about. He was like, "Man, I'm I'm I'm, I'm about tired of the vibe." You know, everybody, (laughs) you know, he was like, man, I'm grown. I got children on the way. I'm married. I want to hear about, you know, how how to have a heavy discussion without arguing with your wife. What do you do when uh, your spouse mad at you? How are you kicking it? How are you getting up going to church? What's the struggle? You You know, I want to hear some grown folks music, you know, and I agree with them. Uh, you know, it's okay to vibe, you know, sometimes I vibe, Absolutely. you know, but like you said, uh, a hundred artists vibing, <laughs> where's the, and I hate to compare this to scripture, but you know, Paul says some on milk and some on meat, where the meat at? Yeah. And, and if, if people do what God tells them to do, we'll have. <laughs> everything we need. I feel like it's not, I'm saying God is calling people to do it. I don't know who those people are. I mean, there are some people that are doing it. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, what's his name? The dude that lives here. Um, I'm really bad with like remembering people's names. Derek Miner. <laughs> Derek Miner. Now yeah. I mean, he on some grown man stuff. Like, yo, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Buy houses, get money, love God. You know what I'm saying this is how you deal with mental health. This is how you go through things. You know what I'm saying? Pray. You know, like, like we we need more people that's just on that because that's how mm-hmm. you get through life. I you know I mean, it's cool to and I feel like this is more of a duty of people that are adults. You know say I'm an adult making music. I don't have that mm-hmm. expectation of somebody that's 20 years old. You haven't really mm-hmm. lived a long enough life. To, to talk about marriage and kids and struggles and houses and how to deal with going to work. You just happy to be saved. God's blessed you with a job. And you know what I'm saying? You rapping about what's like relevant to you because you're 20 years old or you're 18 years old. But when you're 45 and when you're 38 and when you're 40, you're 32, you're 35, you shouldn't sound like an 18-year-old. I mean, like topic-wise. Like, Mm-hmm. You got more things to talk about that people need to hear. Now, I mean, like um, Dayton, he put out an album about his divorce. You know how many people yeah. need to hear that? Hell, hell in the hallway. Yes, one sir. of my favorite projects. Yes, Me sir. Too. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Because he just was real and explaining what he was going through and what it was like and how he got through it. And mm-hmm. I mean, without really knowing, I know that album helped people. I know that for a fact. It had to, because mm-hmm. there's a lot of people that go through that, mm-hmm. and like people need to hear other people talk about hard things, things that are difficult to go through. And if you can have a dope beat behind it, you know why not? <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, like, I, just, I, just, I just had a single call "Falling," where I'm talking about dealing with my job dealing with sin, dealing with my marriage, dealing with my my kids and just how difficult things can be 
And it feels like you're literally falling. Like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I have God and I still feel unstable. Like, how do I get through this? People need to hear mm -hmm. that everything is not always good all the time. Sometimes mm -hmm. it sucks. Sometimes God mm -hmm. is with you and you're still broke. Sometimes God is with you and your marriage is still falling apart. Mm -hmm. That's life. But you need mm -hmm. somebody to tell you it's, you know, saying that's OK. You can still get through it. I'm going through it. We all go through it. But if everybody's talking about how blessed they are and how dope everything is, come on, man. That's right. That's right. Amen. Speaking right on Q2, speaking of falling, uh, I'm going to play this clip from Gorilla Cross when they review falling for you. Yeah. And, and it's kind of about what we're talking about, but I'm going to play this clip right quick. No, I, I really, I, I like this track as well. Um, I think that if if that person singing was a legitimate singer and the way you layered that that that's that's some amazing workmanship. Yeah, that's dope. I really like the artwork. I love. Um, was that also like an interview of like who was in the interview, like the talking, or was that a like sampled interview, or was that you just doing ad libs on your own? Um, I'm gonna yeah, I'll, I'll give the I'll give it a, a four as well. Um, I just. I personally like like how the best way I can say is like it's a period piece like how, how you were saying like how it brought you to a certain time. Mm -hmm. I think that's how music should be, man. Like music should take you out of where you're at and put you somewhere. Yeah. Um, I think it's I think it's dope. Um, and definitely the skill sets there. So, I mean, what would you give it? Four point two. Three, and uh, you gave it a four. Man, that was a clip from uh, uh, Gorilla Cross reviewing Fallen, right? And I love that part of the review. When you hear a review like that as a Christian, how does that make you feel? That your song impacts people. And he gave you a four out of five. I give you a five out of five for Paul. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, how 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 does that how does that impact you to keep going? Yeah, it's 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 super encouraging. It 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 kind of reminds me I'm doing this right. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm doing what God told me to do and I'm seeing the effects of it. You know what I'm saying? Like I actually created a whole Instagram page of just positive comments that people have given me since I started rapping again. Uh, just as a reminder to myself, like whenever you feel like, you know, well, I don't have enough plays or it's not enough, um, people recognizing me, you know what I'm saying? Like you get all these weird, you know, feelings like, you know, like why am I really doing this if I'm only going to get a hundred plays or if, if nobody really recognizes me for being around for this long and, you know what I'm saying? Whatever feeling I have, it's like, God always shows up. Like, stop worrying about that. Like, that's not what this is about. This is not about plays. This is not about, how many people recognize you for your hard work? It's about you doing what I told you to do. And I think sometimes that gets lost in the sauce. And I love when God reminds me of that. Like, um, you're doing what I asked you to do. And that's all I need you to do. Don't get caught up in the plays. Don't get caught up in how many people checking for you. Don't get caught up in the playlist. Just do what I asked you to do. And... That's the most rewarding feeling because it's like, oh, somebody else sees the value in this. This isn't pointless. This isn't a waste of time. This actually is reaching people. And it's like, mm -hmm. okay, that's what's up. Mm -hmm. That's why I repost every time I get something like that. It's 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 really for myself. You know what I'm saying? Just so I don't forget, mm -hmm. like, look, these people is feeling what you're doing and it's blessing them. So don't stop doing that. You know what I'm saying? And then um yeah. I think I, th I, um, I think that was Joe Sype talking. He sent me a, he mm -hmm. sent me a DM like, "Yo, keep going, man! Like you're doing a good job." Mm -hmm. And I was even an extra on top of the cake icing. Like you said, I wasn't mm -hmm. just saying that for the show. I'm letting you know in the DM that like, yo, no, I mean that was really dope. Yeah, man, that's dope, man. And speaking about falling, that's off your uh, latest release. Um, God made me do it. The deluxe album, yeah. man. Tell the family, man. Share, share what brought that on. What, what, what brought on the uh, uh, this album of this magnitude like this? Yeah. So, you know, the 
the uh, God made me do our original album, which is which is in the background right there. Uh, <laughs> um, I no put cover. That out, no. I put that out in uh, 2020, and it just was a culmination mm. of me fulfilling what I felt like God told me to do. Like, so that's why it's called God made me do it. You know what I'm saying I was I was trying to think of a cooler way to say it, but I just couldn't mm. I couldn't think of anything more cool. I just was like, yo, he's making me do it, and. Um, I love the cover art because the dude drew like exactly what I was feeling like. <laughs> God has his finger in my back and he's pushing me to do something that I'm not really super wanting to do. I'm just here because God wants me to be here. And then I came out with the deluxe version because I felt like one, not enough people heard the first one. And then two, I got some more songs that I feel like should have been on that album since then. So I just threw those on there. And uh, I think it, it just came out to be more like of a of a well-rounded project. Mm -hmm. Yep. So tell the fans what they can expect. The additional tracks, the remixes, the new features. If I'm sitting down with this album, you tell us what can we expect when we put this on? So, I mean, you're going to get storytelling. You're going to get lyricism. You're gonna get dope beats. You're gonna get uh, really dope features. Um, um, essentially, what I did was I took all the verses off that I thought was whack on the first one, and I put a feature there. So I got um, uh, my man um, Iron Will from Rochester, New York, where I'm from. I got um, Saint Jones on there. Uh, I got my man Two B on there, and basically, you say I just re-listened to the first album. And I say, you know, this verse wasn't really as strong as I liked it to have been. Boom, let's get a feature. Because I know the feature is going to come strong. And I basically told everybody that did a feature, I said, I need you to rap better than me. <laughs> so, like, don't feel like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Because rappers have this thing where it's like, well, I don't want to outshine the main person. And some people feel like, I'm definitely going to outshine the main person. But I just told them, outshine me. I need you to outshine me. Because it's going to make the track better. It's going to make the album better. And it's just going to be just all around, just better. And everybody stepped up to the plate and killed it. So I'm just like, I mean, you're going to get, you're going to get everything that I just talked about. You know what I'm saying? You know, essentially the album is, it's a boom bap hip hop album. If that's what you love, if that's what you like and you missing it and you wish it was here, it's here. It's right here. God made me do it. Deluxe. It's way better than the first one. All the tracks are remastered, remixed. Um, you know, just to kind of beef it up, new features. It's dope, man. It's super fire. Yeah, man. Speaking of collabs, man, I'm just shout out to the Saint Jones, man. He's been on the show, man. One of my friends, my, my brothers out there in Christ. Yeah. And Christ died for this. Christ yes. died for this. That man, right, right after the intro that comes on, man. Man, I know the story, but tell the family how that collaboration came. So, um, Essentially, I called St. Jones and I said, yo, I need you to get on this track. And he kind of pussyfooted for a little bit. It's like, yo, <laughs> man, like, yo, I need you on this track. You, you know what I'm saying? And I basically just told him straight out. I said, yo, you rap better than me. I need you on this track. The first verse I had on this originally was not that good. And uh, I feel like this song would just be taken to another level if you get on it. So... He wrote his verse so quick, man, and it was so fire. I was just, just like, yeah. I was like, you done already? He was like, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> and then and then I told him, yo, I need you to go back and I need you to talk at the beginning and do ad-libs at the beginning. So then he went back, he did ad-libs at the beginning, and he took the song to a whole nother level. I pulled the old song off because I didn't want anybody to find it because it just it don't sound as good without him <laughs> on it. So I just was like, yo, we just going to pull him <laughs> Pull my whack verse off and put him on there, and let's just pretend the other one didn't exist. <laughs> but that's how it came about. Man, that's what's up, man. When he posted it uh, on his timeline, he tagged me in it, right? Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. and I, and and I'm trying to re remember. Y'all did the video. Was it on Zoom? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so um. What I did was, me and him was talking. It's like, yo, man, we got to shoot a video for this. And I was like, well, yo, how much money you got? I ain't got no money. How much money you got? 
I don't have any money either. <laughs> so <laughs> I just kind of sat down and I just came up with this idea like, yo, let's just let's just record a video on Zoom. And so mm. uh, obviously it wasn't like an actual Zoom call like this is right here. It was mm -hmm. like, yo, you get in front of your camera, do your thing. I'm going to get on mm. my camera, do my thing. And I'm going to mm. make it look like it's a Zoom call. So that when people watch it, it feels like they're on Zoom. But it was mm. edited and all that stuff to make it look better than, you know what I'm saying, what it would have been. But but yeah, that's how it came to be. Man, that's dope, man. Uh, me and one of my friends, we were talking about uh, people referencing God, right? Uh -huh. Like uh, Big Homie, OG in the Sky, and et cetera. Uh, you had a bar in Christ died for this about that. Does what? that bother you? What did yeah, I say? you had a bar. I can play it. Hold on. I don't remember. <laughs> Let that. Me, uh, yeah, I thought you. Uh, I know I was talking from God's perspective in my verse. Oh, okay. So, okay. Well, then I'm just going to ask this because I don't want to play it. I want people to go out screaming, buy it, buy it. You know, the album, uh, artists need. We, you know, artists need money. Uh, screens <laughs> don't pay them, you know. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. But I'll say this. So your perspective, you was, you know, speaking like what you just said from godly perspective, right? So that's one of my pet peeves. It kind of bothered me, right? Yeah. You know. When people say, uh, big homie in the sky. <laughs> yeah. And big old G in the sky. And, you know, I'm kind of like, put some speck on his name. About right. that, you know? So, uh, so that's another question. Does that bother you? Um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't think I really pay too much attention to that. Like, like whenever people talk about God's name, I kind of tune out a little bit because I, I don't want to make it seem like God's name is not important. Like God's name is important, but I feel like people be focusing too much on, you know, his real name was Yeshua. His real name was your Yehoshua. His real name was this. And, uh, you know, when you say God, you're not really saying who he really was. And, you know, and when you do the history on it, the Jewish people back in the day never said his name because they felt his name was too holy to even speak. So that's Absolutely. why they started using other names like, mm -hmm. you know, what I'm saying let's talk about the one who should not be named because he's so holy. Like, mm -hmm. But now everybody is just like, oh, his name is this. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like, if you really try to take it back to the original, you really shouldn't be saying his name at all. Because it's just mm -hmm. holy, it shouldn't even be spoken. But um, I think I think it bothers me whenever people don't take God seriously. So like, if that's where you feel like, yo, like you are lessening the seriousness of who we talking about. Absolutely, I do not like that. Like that's whack to me. Like, mm -hmm. like we are talking mm -hmm. about God, and I think you know what? I think I did say something about that because in my verse, I was talking from God's perspective, and I just was saying like, you know, recognize who I am. You, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm God. I'm the person you need to be mm -hmm. serving. I can't actually like remember my lyrics right now, but but I remember mm -hmm. like that's what my my whole point of the verse was to was to speak to people in a way I felt like God would be talking to them. So, yeah. Amen, amen. Man, speaking of the deluxe, grown man. Yeah, that's my favorite song. I, man, I had this conversation with my boy. Matter of fact, I just had him with one of my boys yesterday. Mm -hmm. So, your definition, what is a grown man to you? So, a grown man is somebody that is mature and serves God and lives the way his life is supposed to be lived. Um, he uses wisdom. He's not, he's not, you know, basically all the stuff that God says, like, don't be quick to anger, be slow to speak, um, seek God and, you know what I'm saying, see what he wants us to do for our lives. When you don't have an answer to something, you use your best judgment, wisdom. Um, you take care of your children, all of them, not just the ones that you made with the current person you're with. Like, like you, you, you handle things in a way 
that a man should handle it. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you got to turn up on people just because people need to recognize, like, I'm a man. Like, you just can't talk to me any kind of way. Like, all of that. You know what I'm saying? Everything that Jesus encompassed. I think, I think too, um, you know, in today's society or, you know, in like certain sects of society, men are not allowed to show like a, a weak or a soft side. Like, you can't cry. You can't be emotional. You can't do this. You can't do that. Or you're not like a real man. But like, you know what I'm saying? Let's look at Jesus' example. Jesus cried. Jesus was humble. But at the same time, he was flipping tables over. At the same time, he was letting Pharisees have it. Like he knew exactly who he was. And him displaying a particular emotion didn't stop him from being who he was. He was just not afraid to be everything God called him to be. And sometimes you just have to not be worried about what people are going to think about what you look like or what you sound like, but just be who you are. And if 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 who you are is grounded in Christ, you're going to always be good. Amen. Amen, man. Well said. I, um, I'll get back to it, but I was just telling my boys that, you know, the world looks at a man one way, but God looks at you another. Absolutely. I said, yeah, you you bring home the bacon, you what else, right? Mm -hmm. But are you bringing Christ into your house? Are you praying with your wife? Are you presenting Christ in front of your children? Are you opening the Bible? Do they see you praying? Absolutely. Are you know, that's what you judge on. Set an example because in the late Charles Stanley words, one of his sermons, he said that we are the first image of God that our children see. Absolutely. Also, too, I mean, we live in a society today where men are not even men. Like men are actual, like literally women. <laughs> like, That's right. like That's right. I don't feel like a man. I'm a woman. And then you got weak men dressing up as women to win in women's sports. <laughs> like, you, know, you can't even yeah. compete with other men. And I'm just like, mm. you, you know, so that's a little bit off topic, but I'm just thinking like, that's just so backwards. Like, yo, we live mm. in a society where everything is being flipped upside down. Mm -hmm. Amen, and that'll be a whole nother podcast. I don't I know. Yep. <laughs> 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 That'd be a three-hour podcast, though. But yeah, man, back to the deluxe, man. What's your favorite song on? I mean, you just said it, "Grown Man." Well, actually, I have a few favorite. I got, I like all the songs, really. But uh, 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 the top ones are probably going to be "Grown Man," "Imagine God," um, Three Fifths," "The God Made Me Do a Remix." <laughs> And I'll just I'll just end up listing all the songs, but those are the top ones. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I would tell you something, man. You had me laughing. That party crashes uh, yeah. interlude, man. How you come up with something like that? I, I, I wanna. I'm gonna say this before you answer. Yeah. I was like, is it a deeper meaning to this skit? What is it, or is it just fun? What's going on? So how 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 you came up with that? <laughs> so okay, so let me tell you, there is a deeper meaning to the skit. I don't know if you went through the whole album. I explained the deeper mm -hmm. meaning, I think, on like track twelve or whatever. But mm -hmm. but um, essentially, I've had this skit in my mind since I was like eighteen or something. I actually have another one too that God gave me a long time ago that I'm gonna do out too. But mm -hmm. um, what happened was. I was just going to tell the story in my own voice. Like, okay, there was this guy, he did this and he did that. Mm -hmm. And um, I worked with, um, excuse me, <coughs> I worked with this group called Creative Air. It's uh, Chris Dawson and Maya Dawson from, um, from uh, Track Stars. And these people are... So, I mean, I mean, they chose the perfect name for their business, Creative Air, because they are extremely creative. So, so I told them the story, and I was like, "Yeah." So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say it in my own voice and whatever. Chris was like, "Nah, man. Like, why are you gonna do that? Like, you should make a skit and have different people acting out the parts." And I just was like, 
I don't know people like that to be getting them to, you know, to act out the parts or whatever. And they said, you know what I'm saying? They basically said, we'll find the people, we'll write it out. You know what I'm saying? We'll actually write out the script and then we'll show it to you. And then you can kind of make tweaks of that. So, I mean, that's exactly what they did. They found the people. I paid the people. They wrote the script. And, and like 90% of what they put is what I kept. The other 10% was just like little minor adjustments. So, well, let's, let's make him say this. Let's make him say that. And then, um, and then I think I jumped on the recording as well. I was like, oh, you know what would be dope is if I had the dude that he was talking to that told him about the party was actually in the party. So I jumped on my mic and did like back in the day, I kind of stepped back from the mic and was like, Hey, yo, what up? Or so, something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, and it, it just came out super dope. And then I wanted to craft the soundscape of it. So I went and grabbed all the sounds from all the different places. So I got sounds of the street, sounds of a dog barking, uh, you know, horns and you know what i'm saying just a whole bunch of different sounds so it would sound like and kind of bring you there mentally like he's really in front of a house somebody really opened the door but really mm -hmm. i got a sound effect that goes and then i was like okay mm -hmm. well when he opens the door the music would get louder so let me mm -hmm. let me fade the music in as the door opening you know what i'm saying so it sounds like it's really a door opening and then you know what I'm saying? All that is part of the production of it, but yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Man, we're kind of running long, but I got to get these couple of questions, man. Yeah, uh, man, I got time. To... I got time, bro. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Man, Fallen, right? Mm -hmm. They, Gorilla Cross even talked about the, the artwork, right? Mm -hmm. So, I seen where you use AI, Mid Journey. Yep. Right? To create the cover art. Yep. Do you think AI and that's artificial intelligence uh, for the people out there listening can help Christians and Christian artists? Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I pay I pay ten dollars a month, bro. If somebody do mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. and you know, said like, yo, here's a, here's a perfect example. The album art that's behind me right now. Mm -hmm. I had I had an actual artist draw that for me. That cost me. I think three hundred dollars or something, maybe three fifty. I can't remember how much I paid, but it was a lot of money to me at the time. And um, AI basically came with the same quality for ten dollars a month. In fact, I put both of the album covers up on a Twitter post, and I and I said, "Tell me which one is AI and which one is real." And everybody said, "I I have no idea." They couldn't mm -hmm. tell because the quality was the same. And so mm -hmm. if you know what to put in for the description, if you know uh, how to talk to a computer and tell it, I need something that looks like this in the style of this, and I want it to look like that, um, you're going to get some pretty incredible stuff, man. So, yeah, absolutely. Sir, yes, sir. I've been... Uh, um, we got an artist on our team. People know our background. We got a ebook coming out oh, okay. with artwork yeah so this is a little scene of uh uh praying people evil versus good with uh yeah that was dope <laughs> yeah <laughs> with uh our main character raymond in it right um but i use ai just started getting into it so i use a chat gpt yep, uh, plug right and I was discussing this with one of the homies out there, Picasso, uh, over there with 520, mm -hmm. that's behind create creating our website and uh, hosting and everything like that. Man, great brother in the faith. And the chat GPT actually wrote a couple of codes for me for the website. And the website jumped with the coding, right? And is also helped me prepare for different things, YouTube ideas and things like that, right? Um, and my brother said, just use it as a helper because I'm the one that do the submissions. I'm the one that do the post. I 
clip the the scenes, the YouTube, the Instagram, the TikTok, yeah. along being the husband, a dad, yep. you know, and everything like that. And then, to, and this is no jab to nobody, but when you ask somebody to help you get to a certain level, it's always about the change. I get it. You can support biblically as well. You know, never man nothing. Uh, you know, pay a man what his worth is. You know, the farmers, everything. But that's a whole nother different discussion uh, within itself because that goes on and on to different meanings too. Right. But this chat GPT has really been helping me, man. I'm talking about getting my stuff together, my ideas. Uh, I write eBooks. Man, I would have had to pay thousands of dollars for this uh, so editor to edit the ebook, right? Mm -hmm. So the only dilemma I do have with it that me and Picasso was talking about and a couple of the homies out there, uh, Joseph with the coat on, Hugh Holler, mm -hmm. TC the collector. Uh, the only thing I see that could be a negative, right, is God gave me this original story to the book. I don't want the AI to write the book because I feel like it would be a real. <laughs> You know, it's almost like saying, AI, write this Christian rap song for me. Well, God ain't giving them bars in the AI did, you know. <laughs> but, <Right. laughs> but I think that through discipline, that person with limited resources like us that do a lot of stuff out of our pocket, website hosting, uh, you know, everything, man, you know how it is, Prophet. You've been out here a while. Mm -hmm. And when you even too. ask website for Website hosting, I do all of that. Oh, okay, okay. You know, and then sometimes I've ran into people that's discouraging that you see gifts, but then they quote you a price and you're like, man, I can't reach that. You know, how can I figure this out? So I think that the AI is sort of like the internet back then yes. when it came out in full bloom. I'm talking about uh, after MOS DOS and AOL.com, <laughs> right. you know, all that type stuff. But the internet that we know now, it can be used for good and it can be used for evil. Absolutely. Just and I just think as Christians, just have to be grounded. Now, uh, I don't have to use, you know, mid journey. I wouldn't know how to type that stuff in. Now, the artist on our team, Eric, shout out to Eric. He like, man, <laughs> you know, but I keep it real with myself. I try to keep it as real as I can with God. We got an artist out on the team and it cost me less than $10 to get, you know, artwork. So, but I could see how it benefits artists for cover art. Uh, man, I've been tightening up write-ups. You know, you ask somebody when they send that, like yours are very professional when you submit it, uh, falling to us in your deluxe album. Uh, all I had to do was copy and paste and put in your socials and it was great. But you have some people out there that don't have that skill set. So when you ask for a description of the song, they'll say like, um, well, God gave me this song, and that's it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I feel you. So, yeah, and I use yeah, ChatGPT so. to help me tighten up the thing I sent you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what I'm saying. So, mm -hmm. like, I use it for, like, keyword research. Yeah. Uh, you know, the word, people don't realize, okay, I get your song, I get it. But the more words you give me, a description you give me, that's what the internet run off of. It's right. not necessarily the music. It's the words that you input, right? So, yeah, I know AI could be a scary thing. I would definitely say be grounded, be in your word. Don't uh, you use it. Don't allow it to use you. Yeah, I think, I think too, like, it's just like, it's no different than anything else. It's just another thing. Like, you know, people said that when, when TV came out. When VCRs came out, when DVDs came mm. out, anything that 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 like technology brings, there's always a negative side that is a possibility. Like you know, what I'm saying you you um you know like when the internet came out, it was oh no porn. Now porn is in your pocket on your phone if you really want to see it. And mm -hmm. it's not like back in the day. You know, what I'm saying like back. I'm saying back when I was maybe 15 or 16 i'm at my i'm at my grandparents house 
I go in my grandfather's room and he got porn tapes in his in his in his drawer. Well, now mm. you don't gotta go in somebody's drawer in a room when they're not home. Like you could just pull mm. out your phone at any time and pull up whatever you want to see. Good things mm. and bad things. So it's really about mm. what do you really want to see? Where are you really mm. at? And and like mm-hmm. you said, it's like you have to be a well-rounded person, just period, because you will mm-hmm. be got real quick and be caught up in all types of things you ain't supposed to be in just because your lust mm-hmm. is just taking over. And I don't mean just lust mm-hmm. for naked people, but lust for money, mm-hmm. lust for, you know, what I'm saying trying mm-hmm. to be the top of the business world, lust for whatever you got mm-hmm. lust for. Um, mm-hmm. Satan presents it to you. So glossy and beautiful. Yeah, come get this. You don't need to read mm-hmm. today. Spend four hours researching mm-hmm. this. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You don't you don't need to pray. You don't need to call your brother that left you a note that said he was going through something. Mm-hmm. Call him later. He, you know what I'm saying? Let's get mm-hmm. to this. Oh, that Christian rap you like so much? Let's write some more songs. That's that's real golly. Yeah, but I haven't prayed yet. You don't need to pray. Just come on. Let's just mm-hmm. get inspired by me, the devil, for your Christian mm-hmm. rap. And then mm-hmm. your whole song is about, I'm so blessed because I'm making all this money. Mm-hmm. Word. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. Man, you know what I'm saying? Like you gotta stay, you gotta stay tapped into God, man, or you're gonna be lost. Yes, sir. I can talk to you all day about the blessings, boy. They be kidding me with that, man. With with the overall blessing. They don't want to talk about that. But they just want to talk about the materialistic things. Yeah, man. So, yeah, that's dope, man. Man, tell the people, man, what you want them to get out of God Made Me Do It Deluxe. So, if you like boom bap music, first of all, if you don't like boom bap hip hop, then this ain't the album for you. Don't even listen to it because that's what this is. But if you like that, if you like boom bap hip hop and you've been you've been missing it and wanting it, this is for you. You're going to get the unadulterated dopeness. You got bass lines, beats, dope lyricism, godly, um, godly references, godly, uh, I don't know what the word is, but it's just like, um, I basically tried to make the album that I always wanted when I was a kid. You know what I'm saying? When I was a kid and I, I like really gave my life to the Lord. I wanted to hear A Tribe Called Quest, The Roots, um, all my favorite rap artists at the time talk about Jesus because that's what I was about. And I I mean, it, it just didn't exist. This album is what I always wanted. So it's like you get the dope vibe of 90s boom bap hip hop combined with the spiritual godly uh, essence, I guess. <laughs> I'm running out of descriptive words. I I, I should have went on Chat GPT before you asked me, <laughs> so I have a better answer. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, that's all right, man. I know the album still new, uh, uh, new out there in the space. But I gotta ask, what's next for Prophet Josiah? Yeah. So uh, musically, the next thing I'm doing is an album called the album's gonna be called I Need God. Um, and essentially is going to be talking about why we need God and specifically why I need God. Um, so it's going to be talking about a time in my life, which was like before 2023, everything from 2022 backwards, maybe about three or four years, all this crazy stuff I was going through and just feeling like, God, where are you at? I need you. This is crazy and I'm struggling and I want people to hear that because if, if if all you talk about is how, how dope your life is, people don't really get to understand, you know what I'm saying, like what's really going on. So I want people to hear the struggle, all the difficult things I had to go through and that's what that project is going to be about. It might be weird because you're going to listen to it and feel like, oh, this is probably what he's going through now, but it's really old. 2023, God basically he fixed everything like from my job to my marriage to um just you know what I'm saying how I feel about life a whole lot of things have changed almost as soon as 2023 hit 
And I was just like, oh, snap, God is really out here. But it's like, if I never went through that bad spot, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know what it's like to struggle. You know what I'm saying? I have to really need God. You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm trying to think of the, of I guess the right way to say it, but I need God. And so I'm talking about it on this album, essentially. Hey man, that grown folks music, once again, once again. Yes, sir. On your longest day and hardest battle, what scripture did you find strength in? Um, probably the the one I go to a lot is Philippians 4, 4 through 8. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about but anything. In but in everything, yep. by prayer and petition, yeah, I don't have it. With thanksgiving, present your, present your request to God. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard Lord your hearts and, hearts and your minds. Jesus. Yes, yes. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, all whatever that. is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is if good report, anything man. is excellent or praiseworthy, think All about these things. things. And then, like yeah. that, that scripture right there, it I mean, it's basically mental health. Like, don't focus on the fact that you ain't got no money. Don't focus on the fact that your marriage is trash. Don't focus on all these other things you don't need to be focused about. Be anxious for nothing. Let's lose the anxiety and replace it with whatever's lovely, pure, good report. If there's anything praiseworthy, think about and focus on these things. Yes, sir. Like, that pretty much gets me through everything in my whole life, bro. <laughs> Amen. Amen, man. Prophet Josiah, any last closing remarks? Um, Seek God, bro. Seek God. He is real. He really out here. I mean, he's really, really super out here. I mean, not just like, oh, yeah, God help you get groceries. No, God is like out here. Like, yo, my new job I got, man, it don't make no sense. It just, it don't make no sense at all. In fact, you know what? Let me, let me just give this testimony real quick. I'm supposed to do this on my own YouTube channel, which I'm going to do, but let's just talk about it. So last year, um, Probably in like November, October, I told my wife, I said, I need to get another job. This job is stressing me out. I got high blood pressure. I don't need a whole lot of stress. So I said before the end of the year, if I don't find a new job, I'm quitting my current job. I don't care. Um, I just, I just, I just, I, I'm saying I can't do it. So um, I got discouraged. My wife said, no, you should apply for work. So I started applying for work. I applied to two places. Uh, I'm saying they looked at my resume and basically said, nah, we good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so, you know what I'm saying? So I got mm -hmm. discouraged again. And then I saw this other job, which is a current job with that, 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 that I'm currently working at. And um, the description was really super vague. The pay was super vague. I just applied for it anyway. And God just orchestrated this whole super dope thing. So I do the interview. The interview goes extremely well. And then they basically tell me, this is a new position that didn't exist. So you get to kind of set up the job however you want it to be. Um, nobody's ever going to oh, wow. say to you, why are you doing this or not doing that? Because nobody else has ever done it before. So you're the first person to do it. So I'm like, okay, cool. Mm. So then I get there and I'm talking to the person that's interviewing me about my pay. And she said, well, I know you said you wanted to get this much. But now I went, oh, here they go. They about to screw me. So <laughs> and so she said, but let me tell you, um, I don't have control over the pay. What happens is it goes through this whole process or whatever. So she said they gave me a number that they said they wanted to pay you. And um, I determined that number wasn't high enough. So I sent it back to them and they raised it up. So your pay is going to be exactly what I asked for it to be. But she said, um, I just wanted to let you know, we didn't just give it to you because we asked, you know, said because you asked for it, we gave it to you mm -hmm. because I went through this whole process to make sure you got it. And I started thinking like, this lady doesn't know me. Why yeah. are you fighting for my pay 
And I don't know mm-hmm. you. Most places just be like, screw you. This is what we pay. You take it or leave it. Mm-hmm. But the fact that she was fighting for me to get the good pay before she even knew who I was, I just thought that was crazy to me. Then, mm-hmm. then I get in the job and the flexibility and the autonomy that I have at the job is just like, mm-hmm. it's just incredible. Like, like it's such a blessing. I can't even really say all the stuff I get to do. <laughs> because it would just be like, is that a job? Like, it's a job. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? And and, 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 and and from that to, you know what I'm saying, difficulties with 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 my marriage and me and my wife almost being divorced and then not being divorced. And then maybe we should get divorced and this isn't working. That isn't working. And I remember praying and just being like, Lord, I can't control nobody but me. I'm here. Mm. This is difficult. I don't know what to do. My wife is basically saying the same thing on her side. Like, I don't know what we're saying what's wrong with him. <laughs> and I'm saying, I don't know what's wrong with her. And and then God literally just it just starts working. It just it 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 feels like in a movie where somebody waves a wand and magically things start changing, although it's not magic. Like God just started doing things. And I'm just like, yo, why? This is, I feel so like I don't deserve this. You know what mm. I'm saying? Like, I'm not worthy of what you're doing. Uh, mm. This this is amazing to me. And so now I have a rejuvenated like, yo, God is out here. I don't care how difficult your life is, how difficult your marriage is, how crazy your job is. Like, God is out here. Just keep seeking him. He got you. Do my last mm-hmm. words, man. God's out here. <laughs> hey, man, man. Thank you. Thank you, Prophet Josiah, man. I know that's going to bless somebody, man. Like we said in the beginning of the show, man. I want to give you a special thank you, too, my brother, for blessing us with your words, man, your ministry. And I pray that the Lord continues to bless you, your family, Amen. your ministry, for many years to come, bro, man, because we need people out here like you, uh, spreading his word, uh, able to articulate it to people, to younger, to older people, and the role that you play in society, just alone, man. I'm a family man, so I know how it can be as a creator, and God gave you a vision, but your first ministry is your family. So I just want to, you know, pray for your strength, man, and for, you know, you to keep carrying the torch, my brother. And thank you again for coming on the show. Thank you, man. I really yes. appreciate it. Yes, sir. Well, it's been an amazing conversation with the incredible, talented, and inspiring Prophet Josiah. Before we say goodbye, make sure to follow Prophet Josiah on all his social media accounts to stay updated on his latest projects and upcoming events. Also, don't forget to check out the show notes for the links and more information. Thank you for tuning in to the Bookkeeper 247 podcast. We'll see you on the next ride. Peace. Peace.